There's a concept called attachment, which you've probably heard about. A close emotional bond developing between an infant and a caregiver. Now, stereotypically, that's the mother. But we now know a lot more about family possibilities than we ever have. And it turns out you don't have to have a biological mother and a biological father in a perpetual relationship of happiness to have decent and loving child rearing experiences, right? A grandma could raise a kid, a grandpa could raise a kid, a foster parent could raise a child, an adoptive parent could raise a child, a sibling could raise a child. What matters is that you have a caregiver identified. Usually, of course, that falls to the mother, right? So there's that double standard. <laughs> Women, you got to go out and make a career, but also watch after the baby all the time, right? Be the primary mother and breadwinner. That's a tough set of roles to try to conquer. But that doesn't mean a guy couldn't do it. In fact, many do. And it's very rewarding to be a caregiver for children if you're wired to do that, because not everybody is, because there's individual differences in everything. So you've got a caregiver, and you're hoping for a close emotional bond to form. Now, there's a reason why we want the bond to form. It seems just so natural, but y'all all know that not everybody is going to be naturally attached to children. Not everybody feels compelled to be the best mom or dad they can be. Many people do, and as we'll see, David Bowlby would argue that the species kind of wires us to do that on average, to feel compelled to care for the children. If we can get a close emotional bond that's positive, then it forms a secure attachment base for child development. Secure could even be thought of as a safe base. If you see a kid, a little kid, I see this in, in my niece now, when you first get there, to visit, she's like this, over by mom or grandma or whoever she spends most of her time with the caregiver, right? Now it's like, baby, you know me. We hung out together. We played, but not yet, right? Hangs out first until people get together. They see how the caregivers respond to the situation. Caregivers are happy to see you. Everything's cool. Then they start getting a little braver. And next thing you know, they're hanging out playing with you just like they did last time because they feel comfortable. But if you got a kid and you go to a park, for example, and you sit down and you're like, okay, little kid, have a good time, play in the park. They don't run off and go play usually. They kind of go like this. They're like, they see all that stuff they want to play on, but then they kind of go like that. Oh, leaf. And they'll come right back to safe base, right? Tag. Everything's cool, baby. It's good. And they go a little further, right? Keep looking back to make sure base stays there. Then they come and hang out with the kid. If they get hurt, what do they do? Run back to base or they cry so base comes to them, right? So they have this experience in the world of secure base of operations, right? They can explore the world with relative safety because somebody's got their back. The caregiver is there for them and it allows them the freedom to interact with the environment and to potentially have a more enriched learning experience. But you don't always get that. Sometimes your base of operations is not a safe or consistent safe base of operations and you can get insecure attachment. And there's two subtypes, broadly speaking, of insecure attachment. One of which is anxious. They're anxious kind of all the time. These kids are pretty high strung. Now, it's not to say that the caregiver causes this or that the child is born in a way that fates them to this existence. But when you get a situation where reciprocal determinism makes it such that the kid doesn't feel all that secure around the caregiver, but they flip out when the caregiver is gone and they don't get easily comforted when the situation is resolved and the caregiver comes back. And the other kind is this ambivalent type. They're uninterested around the caregiver. They don't even seem upset when the caregiver goes away. Well, that's unusual. Statistically speaking, it would be unusual for a kid to just be totally ignoring the caregiver, whether they were there or not there in toddlerhood, right? Early childhood development, you would expect most children to be bonded to a parent or a caregiver. Now, how are you going to operationalize something like this? Study it empirically. Well, Mary Ainsworth came up with this thing called a strange situation to measure attachment. She was creative. She needed a reliable and valid way to measure this to understand it better, to see what the outcomes were. In the moment, 
and then to see how that affected people down the road. Well, it turns out this affects people down the road. This has effects that could last into adulthood, whether you have a secure attachment, and that's about 60% of the people, 66% of the people, or an insecure attachment where the rest are kind of divided between these two categories. But there are times and different people and different caregivers in your life with whom you might be more securely attached or more insecurely attached. So we're really talking about the primary caregiver. And what she would do, she would have a mother bring the toddler in, usually it was mothers, right? And then they would come into the room. The room is a research room. It's got toys in it and it's got a stranger in it. That's weird for kids, but if the parent is cool with it, then the kids usually cool out and they hang out, right? Well then, what does the parent do? They leave them. They walk out the door and close the door. Now, that bothers securely attached kids. Oh goodness, the secure base has gone away. They start crying, they start getting uncomfortable, and then the stranger comes forward, the stranger's a research assistant, they're for, of course very caring, loving people, but that doesn't make any difference. It doesn't matter if they come over and they're like, baby, it's going to be okay. Your mom's going to come right back. Everything, you just calm out. They're upset because the primary attachment figure left. And you give them a, a few minutes with that and then the attachment figure mother comes back in. If they're securely attached, they calm down really quickly. Right? Secure base is back. Nothing bad happened, but I feel reassured. And then they can pretty quickly go back to playing in the environment and they'll exhibit comfortable behaviors again. The anxious kids are anxious to begin with. They're coming in, the mother comes in, they're looking around like, oh my God, right, this is bad. Doesn't matter whether the mom seems at ease or not at ease. The kid seems not at ease. And when you leave the room, when the caregiver leaves the room, they flip out. They lose it. They're screaming. They're upset. And they are inconsolable, right? Now the researcher ain't got a chance to, to calm this kid. The other kid might react a little bit, but they're not going to be comfortable. These kids are not comforted. But what's interesting is when the caregiver comes back in the room, they do not quickly calm down. They remain upset for extended periods of time. The, this ambivalent, insecure attachment, these kids just seem to be semi-independent of the parent to begin with. They walk in, and they just go, oh, toys. And they're... They don't even notice the parent's gone because they don't care. They don't seem to be registering that. And that, you think, well, that's independent, right? Well, it can be okay. Anything can be okay. Nothing fates somebody in one way or another that is irreversible in, in human experience. But I had the experience once of I was eating with my family at the McDonald's, and this little kid pops up. She's like, hello. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I like kids. What's up? She's like, hi, what are you eating? Like fries. Okay. I'm looking around. There ain't nobody around here. Where's this kid's parent, right? I don't see anybody. This kid's like, I'm gone. Now, the parent's probably around the corner. She went back around. I guess she got back with that parent. But, man, that's dangerous, right? Because I just go, hey, you want to take a ride? She goes, yeah. And then you're gone. Right? So it pays to be a little anxious as a child because that means you engage environments with caution. And caution can be, right, important. Uh, and so you have David Bowlby, who I alluded to, who said that I think in an evolutionary sense, if you remember us going back to the functionalist, William James, right, that we are biologically programmed to love behaviors that bi uh, babies are biologically programmed to emit. Now, if you're being honest about a baby, it screams, it cries, it slobbers, it shits itself, it pees everywhere. It's a mess. It's not really a lovable ball of goo. But if you're inclined to babies, you're like, oh, it's a baby. You make a mess. Did you make a mess? I'll clean that mess up. And what? They're so cute. They got these big whopping heads. No, that's a beautiful little head. Look at your beautiful little head. So Bowlby says, well, what we do is we have this biological programming that attaches us to these children because without that attachment, they will die. And without our love and comfort, they won't make it. So that's the idea of attachment, both in the application and in the biological roots. Y'all have a great day, and I will see you on Wednesday. Harry Harlow and his monkeys. Harry Harlow had some monkeys. He did a thing that nobody ever did before. He started studying a concept called love. 
Nobody studied love before. In fact, the prevailing wisdom of the day was if you got kids, you don't want to be too coddling with them. You don't want to touch them too much. You don't want to cuddle them too much. You don't want to be too quick to respond to their cries because that'll make them soft, right? So the prevailing wisdom in the 40s and the 50s was, you know, be less responsive. Don't be unresponsive to your children, but don't be overly responsive to your children because that was thought to promote resiliency, right? Tough kids who can handle being deprived of a little something or another. But nobody studied love because primarily it was a subject that does not lend itself to operationalization. It is hard to empirically verify something so nebulous, a concept, as love. So he didn't actually verify love per se, what he did was he looked at proxy variables with primates. And what he did was it not a good thing from the monkey's point of view. And some people would legitimately, criti legitimately critique Harlow as being a little bit abusive of the animals, if not outright abusive of some of the animals that he worked with. But what he found out working with these animals held up empirically over time and gave us some empirical justification for this concept of love because what people were saying in the behavioral realm, psychodynamics were talking about the breast and, and the baby fusing as one. You remember, well you don't remember, we'll talk about psychoanalytic theory a little bit more. We talked about it a little bit, but we'll go into that in the personality chapter where he's talking about really that Infants didn't see themselves as distinct from the mother because they're fused to the breast because they didn't have formula or bottles back then. And it was just, a, you have to have it to survive. You have to have a wet nurse if your mom can't lactate. Somebody's got to feed you. And then that became a crucial variable. And then you see that the behaviors will say, well, that's not really love, this bond between the mother and the, and the, and the child. That's reinforcement. We'll talk about that in the next chapter, right? That's just you need to have sustenance, and when you're hungry, this person provides it, so of course you're going to be more likely to hang out with this person. You're going to show some kinds of behaviors that might look like affection, but it can be explained by just primary reinforcement mechanisms. But then moreover, some other people said, well, let's put this to the test, and who are you going to turn to to put that to the test. Well, Harry Harlow gets him some monkeys. Cute little things, ain't they? Little rhesus monkeys. I love monkeys. Baby monkey. <laughs> I call my baby's monkey. My baby's is 29 and, and, and 17. I don't call the young one monkey no more. He don't like that shit. But, but the daughter, she's 29. She don't care. I still call her baby monkey because monkeys are cute and they're sweet. And, and he took these baby monkeys as soon as they were born away from their mothers, never to see them again, right? Because he was going to test this notion of bonding, of attachment, which is what we talked about in the last lecture, right? He wanted to see whether it was really the feeding process. So he randomly assigns his monkeys in an experimental design that you could not do with humans, could be utter, utterly unethical, and some would question the ethics of using these, these monkeys in this way. But what he did was he, he put half of them in a condition where they have this terry cloth mother. All of them have these two alternatives. This pseudo mother, right, this surrogate mother, has a round monkey head with big eyes and ears and a bigger mouth, and it's terry cloth and it's soft. And then the other quote unquote mother got a block head, little eyes, and it's all wire. And so the alternative was either this one provides the nutrients or this one provides the nutrients. You got to eat. Right, so now you're looking at this and saying, well, if it's all about primary reinforcement and this is the mother that provides the nutrients, right, that's the one it would hang out with more. That's the one it would cling to. That's the one it would look like it had affection for and bonding for. But that ain't what happened. The monkeys being fed by the wire mother would only go to the wire mother to eat and then they'd go back to the cloth mother, especially when it inferior. What you see is this baby monkey is hanging out on this monkey, terry cloth colored, and is reaching over for that bottle. It would rather be on that soft, that soft cloth that mimics fur but isn't really fur. And thus he looked at this thing as contact comfort. Something about that soft touch that seems to be critical or necessary for the bonding. It isn't just food or it would be over there. And then he would scare the monkeys. He'd have these little, y'all know the little monkey goes ding, 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 or bangs on the thing, little mechanical wind-up toy. Well, he would show them that and they would freak out and they would run back to the cloth mother. Even if the wire mother was where it got all its sustenance from. So, kind of a 
aversive way to do it. And moreover, he took it even further, which gets into development, into parenthood. He took these monkeys that were not raised by actual monkey mothers, allowed them to grow up, and then put them in monkey pens to see how they would mate, the mating behavior. They didn't mate. They didn't know how to mate. So people go, well, that's just innate, right? That's just reflex. That's just instinct. Of course they'd know how to mate. They didn't have the social skills to actually mate. So he went one step further and created a thing called rape racks, which sounds as nasty as it is. And he would, in, he would have those monkeys bound while other monkeys who were in heat would then inseminate these female monkeys who were raised without a mother, who had no social skills and were unable to mate themselves to see what would happen when they themselves become mothers. Would they then instinctually be able to raise their kids? They didn't. They didn't know how to do it. So it gives you this kind of parallel analog to human beings. Like a human being raised in an abusive and neglectful environment may not become a natural parent, right? It seems that for monkeys where everybody's like, well, that's all about instinct. Monkeys just know what to do. Well, they don't just know what to do. They have to be raised in environments that also capitalize on their abilities and teach them what to do for them to be normal functioning social monkeys and parental monkeys. Now you say, well, that's all good and well for monkeys, but what about people? Well, we've been talking about being able to survive being born prematurely. That's because we have all kinds of heroic medical measures and we can isolate the child in an incubator and provide it with respiration until it's able to breathe on its own, et cetera, et cetera, provide it with nutrients. And early on in the process of developing these procedures, it was thought that you shouldn't touch the child because you would introduce germs potentially, right? They have compromised immune systems. You better keep it as sterile as possible. Don't touch these kids. But then somebody saw these results that Harlow was getting and said, huh, maybe it's important to touch. Apparently it's important just for a monkey to touch a terry cloth. Let's see what happens if we, of course, maintain sterile conditions, but touch the children. Touching the kids actually produces weight gain. <laughs> Premature infants who were not massaged out at, I think we're looking at 14 weeks, and premature infants, three pounds is very, very small. Very, very vulnerable. What do you want these kids to do aside from develop surfactant and, <laughs> and develop the ability to breathe? You want them to gain weight, right? Just touching these kids causes them to gain weight, apparently, right? So what do you got there? Contact comfort. Something about that human contact, or for monkeys, the monkey contact, is actually being played out in physiological terms, right? And so now it is what? Protocol to touch the kids, right? You massage the babies. Now you don't think the babies go, man, I wish somebody would massage me. They don't think like that as we'll see with cognitive development and Piaget. But touching them, which is a proxy to love, right? He was the first person to try to study that concept and that's what he came up with. 